Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, because I like to do that. Um, I think of myself as a developer who likes to write tests. And so a long time ago, I started to write unit tests for the features that I uh, was delivering as a developer. And um, I realized that if I tested more and more of the application that I was writing, I'd have more confidence uh, that I hadn't broken something really, really badly. Um, and uh, eventually, I started using Selenium a lot. And um, now I'm an independent consultant, and my clients hire me to help them figure out how to integrate uh, test automation into their development process. Um, and so I know I've promised to talk a little bit about um, native uh, mobile app automation, um, but I'm going to make a first slight digression first, um, because I want to talk a little bit about um, a couple of issues that I've seen at a couple of my clients. Um, and I'm concerned about it because I feel like these issues prevent my clients from making the most of their investment in test automation. Um, so when I, when I sort of, to sort of realize what was going on, I, I took a, sort of took a step back and, and asked myself, what's the point of, of automated tests in the first place? Um, uh, you know, we, we use them to catch regression bugs. Um, and these tests can do that uh, much more f quickly and more reliably than a human can do that. Um, and uh, a lot of my uh, clients are QA managers, and um, sort of from the QA manager perspective, this is pretty much exactly what they're looking for. Um, but from my developer's perspective, that's only about half the story. Um, and I kind of want to il illustrate this with, some, with a few diagrams. Um, so here we have a sort of very, very basic, uh, I guess, deployment pipeline, uh, where we have a developer over in the corner who's going to uh, commit some code to a source repository because everybody's using source control, right? Um, and um, some sort of build and deploy process um, is going to put that into production. And um, finally, a, a user is going to go get some value out of that software somehow. And if there are any problems with that software, um, the user is probably going to get a little bit frustrated, mad. And if the developer's lucky, somehow that information is going to make its way all the way back to them so that they can fix that bug and then commit a new version of the software to production that doesn't have that issue. Um, and so the issue here is that that feedback, that's a very long feedback loop, that could take weeks um, or longer. Um, and it makes the company or, or the developer or um, whoever, whoever's responsible for the software look bad. We don't like to give, you know, our users, you know, buggy software. So we can definitely do better than this. Um, so now we're going to uh, put our software into a test environment before we put it into production. All right, we're going to have somebody on our team uh, take a look at that uh, that software and make sure that it's actually fit for deployment. And if there's if there are any problems with it, then you know this uh, th this tester is going to tell the developer about them. Um, and um, it's great because the feedback is much more reliable and timely than the feedback that we would get from a user. But um, these tests, depending on how many of them uh, you have, and if you're running them manually, can be quite slow. Uh, and so, you know, while we're, we're getting our feedback more quickly, um, it, you know, may be on the order of, you know, maybe days rather than weeks. And so that's, that's better, but, um, you know, we, we could certainly do better than that. And so this point is where a lot of my clients um, decide that they want to introduce test automation. And so what, they, what they're looking at is, is, is they want this bit right here to be shorter. They want to spend less time doing that. Um, and that's great. We can write some tests that will take a lot of the drudge work out of those manual tests and execute them much more quickly. Um, and that's wonderful. Um, but we're still sort of taking on uh, some additional work here. So if um, we have automated tests that get run sort of at the end of a release cycle um, and we find bugs, then you know, the tester is still going to have to feed that information back to the developer. Uh, and it'll probably have to go through some kind of an issue tracker. Uh, and it'll have to go sort of through the development process again. We'll have to get another build and deployment, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
uh, incidentally, if anybody can think of a better way to hide information than to put it in, in an issue tracker, please let me know because I think that'd be really useful information to have. Wiki. <laughs> oh, excellent. I'll just suggest that to my clients. Um, so it's, um, it's great that we have automated tests now, um, but not, being that they're automated and they take far less time to, uh, to, to execute, we can do them much more often. Uh, and so, in fact, we could probably do them every time a developer commits to the source repository. Uh, and so we can introduce something like continuous integration, where uh, the you know, software like TeamCity or Jenkins uh, or Cruise can you know, pull software from the source repository uh, every time there's a commit that's been made, and we can run those tests automatically. And this is going to uh, further decrease the size of the feedback loop because now it's happening instead of you know, every, or on the order of days, it's happening maybe on the, hour, on the order of hours or minutes. Um, and so we're getting better and better at you know, shrinking the size of the feedback loop here. Um, and it turns out we could do even, even one better than that. Um, what, if we, what if we run these tests uh, on the developer's local environment before they even uh, commit to the source repository? At that point, um, the developers still right in the flow of developing, of creating those tests and fixing the bugs, and, and they have the, the mindset of sort of knowing exactly what could possibly be wrong. And the feedback loop is more on the order of you know, minutes or seconds. And so this shrinking the size of the feedback loop um, is a way to eliminate all of this other work that would normally happen if a bug were to get committed into the source repository. And so to me, test automation is about shrinking that the size of that feedback loop. Um, so just to sum up there, what's the biggest win for automated tests? Faster feedback. Um, quick de develop test feedback helps me make changes with confidence as a developer without interrupting my flow. So, um, let's say we decide we want to write some automated tests. Um, and because our development team is very expensive and very busy, uh, we decide that we're going to hire some new people to work on the tests. Um, and we end up with an organization that looks like this. So we have our developers over here, and they are building and deploying stuff to a test environment. And we have our automation folks over here, and they own the tests. And so when there's a new um, uh, version of the software in the test environment, they run those tests. Um, and then they feed the information about you know, bugs uh, or issues in the, in the code back to the developers. Um, now, there's a bit of an issue with this uh, sort of organization. And, uh, I, I should say, so this, this split between these two teams, this could be, uh, this could be organizational, this could be you know, physical boundary, it could be geographical or temporal. Um, it doesn't really matter. It's just the, the fact that sort of the, this division exists is, is the issue. Um, and when there is that division, um, this, this feedback is, is hard to, uh, to communicate effectively. Um, because uh, as a developer, if, um, if you're building and deploying stuff and you get some feedback about some tests that you don't really know too much about or have any confidence in, um, and uh, if the feedback is, a, is potentially a false positive and you don't have any uh, uh, visibility or authority to make changes to these tests when, when they need to be changed, um, you know, guess what you're going to do when that email comes across uh, saying that there's a failure? So, yes, developers are not going to bother, uh, or they're going to get frustrated, or they're going to file those emails away in a place where they're never going to see them again. And basically what that means is that that feedback loop is being stretched all over again. So, um, you know, it, again, like, you know, when you have uh, people that are um, a situation where you have to file a bug uh, when a test breaks, um, you know, it's... Uh, that, that, that's, that's just making it take longer and longer to uh, turn around uh, those bug fixes. So how, how could we fix this situation? Um, 
we can have uh, sort of more of a merger of the development and automation teams. Um, and this could be uh, a, this doesn't necessarily mean that the developers uh, are themselves writing the tests, um, but uh, you could still have those, that division of roles, but make sure that those, um, you know, perhaps the automation engineer is embedded inside the development team. Um, or at least there, uh, ha there's some sort of communication um, pathway open between those, uh, those, those two groups. Um, the important thing here is that developers have to feel the pain of broken tests. Uh, that's uh, absolutely non-negotiable. All right, so um, that's uh, enough of that for right now. Um, so next, um, I'm going to ask uh, a few silly questions. Um, how many folks here are working on or have worked on a web application? Okay, just about everybody, that's good. Um, how many have found a satisfactory web uh, automation tool? Okay. I think we should ask security to escort anybody off the premises if they didn't raise their hand the second time. Um, now, how many of you are working on a native mobile application? Okay, so a few, maybe 20 or so. And how many of you guys who just rose your, rose your hands, um, how many of you found a satisfactory automation tool for those native apps? What's that? Interns, <laughs> interns. interns. <laughs> That's an awesome solution. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so obviously there's a, there's, there's a need out there and several months ago, um, a, uh, previous client of mine, uh, asked me about a, uh, a new project that he was taking on. Um, he had gone to work for a very large company and they had a portfolio of, uh, mobile applications, uh, iOS, Android, mobile web, um, and he wanted me to help him uh, figure out how to reduce the burden of um, manual testing for these iOS applications. Uh, and so I, it was sort of my job at that point to take a look at the state of iOS test automation tools. And um, you know, I wanted these tools to allow me to write tests that have all the pro good properties of uh, automated tests that I want. So you know, they had to be easy to write and maintain. They had to be fast. Uh, robust, you know, written in a real programming language. Um, and so I started taking a look at uh, a bunch of the tools that were available. This list is actually um, includes some things that were not available when I, when I started looking. Um, you know, you have a uh, um, uh, KIF here from the folks at Square. Uh, Frank is another one that's very popular. Um, Calabash is quite new, but seems to have a lot of traction. Um, I took a look at everything that was out there and ended up uh, going with uh, a project called Native Driver. Um, and um, uh, Native Driver, if uh, there was a lightning talk about Native Driver at the last Selenium Conf, it's basically a, um, uh, an implementation of the WebDriver API that allows you to drive native mobile applications. And we decided that we were going to go with Native Driver for a few key reasons. Um, first of all, it uh, had a familiar API. So we already know how to write tests using the WebDriver API, and now we can write native mobile apps with the same API. That's great. Um, it has a few enhancements for mobile touch devices, um, but pretty much the same thing. Uh, the next reason uh, is that um, Native Driver also promises uh, Android support. Um, and they do this uh, in a similar way to the way that uh, WebDriver uh, offers support for different browsers, uh, in that you just provide a, uh, or you just instantiate a different uh, driver class. Um, now, you won't, you won't necessarily be able to uh, reuse your tests in the same way that you can reuse your, uh, your uh, web driver tests just by swapping out different browsers. Um, because uh, in most cases, uh, or at least in my client's case, they have completely separate code bases uh, for their Android and iOS apps. And so uh, you'd probably want to do something like um, maybe the uh, pluggable test uh, infrastructure that Dima and uh, uh, Jeff were talking about earlier. Um, but we decided that it was still kind of a, a win to have a common test automation API for, across both platforms. 
Um, the biggest winner, though, uh, was that Native Driver has uh, support for hybrid applications. And what I mean by hybrid is that uh, when you write a native mobile app, um, you can use native widgets, uh, of course, uh, but you can also include a, um, a web view, uh, which allows you to pull in uh, mobile web uh, HTML, uh, mobile web uh, applications. Um, and uh, other test automation tools, or many other test automation tools, will just present that web view as just like a simple, any other element that has a value, and it's just gonna be a big blob of HTML. Um, and so you would have to roll your own solution for you know, traversing the DOM and looking up elements and executing JavaScript, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, hmm, why does that sound familiar? Where, where can I find a tool that already does that for me? Oh yeah, web, web driver. So native driver actually includes uh, the uh, iPhone driver from the web driver project. Uh, and it presents the DOM elements uh, inside a web view as uh, elements uh, just like the uh, native uh, UI elements. Um, so the client code looks pretty much the same. Uh, so that was, that was a pretty big, uh, important uh, uh, piece for us. Um, so uh, just to sort of go over the native driver architecture a little bit, um, native driver works by embedding an HTTP server inside your application. And that HTTP server uh, understands the WebDriver protocol, which um, your test code, which uh, in our case was written in Java, uh, can uh, send. And so then the HTTP server uh, looks up uh, elements and queries state on the, those elements and can uh, synthesize uh, touch events uh, on those elements. Um, the slight problem with this architecture is that you have to um, build this HTTP server into your application, and you can, um, you can prevent it from being compiled into your production uh, version of your app, but then you're not quite testing against the exact same uh, artifact that you're sending to the App Store, and that may or may not be a problem for, uh, depending on your, on your sensibilities. Um, the support code in your app is, is pretty minimal. Basically, you're just including a header file and then just telling the, uh, the server to start up uh, in your main class. And the client code is almost indistinguishable from uh, normal web driver code. Uh, we're, we're finding elements, uh, we're sending keys, you know, we're logging in, we're, we're clicking. Uh, it looks pretty much just the same. So, uh, so far, so good. It uh, seems like a pretty clean solution. Um, but there are a few ugly bits. Um, so, first of all, um, Native Driver doesn't support uh, necessarily every type of uh, UI element uh, that you could have in your application. Uh, and if, you, if it doesn't, then you're gonna have to roll up your sleeves and uh, get acquainted with some Objective-C. Um, but it's, that's fairly, not too terrible. Um, and then the, the next two issues are actually not, not specific to Native Driver. They're just sort of um, uh, issues that uh, kind of uh, come up by virtue of the fact that you're doing iOS development. Um, you know, I want to be able to run my test suite from the command line, uh, especially when I want to integrate it into a uh, continuous integration build. Uh, and building from the command line, Apple does provide a, a uh, tool for doing that called Xcode build. Um, but you're much more likely to find useful information on, on Xcode build from a blog post than Apple's developer site. Um, and that can be a bit frustrating. Um, another slightly frustrating, you know, small frustration is that you can't actually launch the simulator from the command line, which is kind of odd uh, feature to be missing from the simulator. Uh, and so you have to use uh, an external program. Uh, there are a bunch of open source options for this out there. One's called iOS Sim, one's called Wax Sim, um, to uh, launch that simulator for you with your application. Uh, and uh, then uh, at that point, you'll be able to execute your tests. So, um, next, uh, challenges. Now, we have now a, uh, a small suite of uh, um, automated functional tests for our iOS application. Um, and the challenges that I'm gonna talk about now are uh, sort of more to do with trying to get value out of those tests now. Um, so, um, you know, we have sort of, um, I'm gonna talk about cultural differences a little bit. Um, in that, um, you know, 
the same word or concept can mean uh, different things to different cultures. So um, this is a photograph that I took uh, about eight years ago at a uh, buffet in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, I was on my bachelor party. Uh, and um, uh, you can see here that the label says fish and chips, um, but the photograph um, is fish and chips if you are on one side of the Atlantic and is definitely not if you are on the other side. Um, and so uh, the word chips means different things to different people. Um, and in that sense, uh, the iOS development culture has a very different view on functional testing compared with that of web developer culture. Um, so if you're used to writing automated tests for uh, web applications, um, uh, you know, you, you know, wh whether you're coming from the Java world, the Ruby world, um, uh, Python or uh, .NET, um, you know, you're at least aware uh, that there are some really great tools for doing uh, test automation. So we have sel uh, Selenium, Water, Capybara, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, test automation is commonplace uh, in web development culture. Um, and, and that's not the case in, in iOS uh, development culture at this point. Um, and there's a word that some people might use to uh, describe this situation. Some people, not me, of course, uh, but some people might describe it sort of this way. Um, Yeehaw! Um, <clears throat> you know, this sort of thing, you know, maybe, maybe a little bit of that. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm totally kidding. I, so when I say, when pe people use the word cowboy, they mean reckless, right? And I don't think iOS developers are any more reckless than any other group of developers as a whole. Um, but uh, test automation maturity is a lagging indicator of overall platform maturity, right? Um, so in that sense, the iOS development world feels a bit more like this. Um, and, and maybe this is unfair because uh, when we talk about the web, the web, we, you know, we've had the web since 1990, right? And then uh, it was, wasn't until about 2004 that we had a good uh, open source option for writing automated tests against web applications. That's 14 years. Um, and, you know, we've had the iPhone since, uh, you know, 2007, um, you know, uh, we started being able to write native apps in, I guess, late 2007, maybe 2008. Um, and, you know, the, another way to think about it is that um, native mobile applications, you know, although we've, they've been around for about five years, they're still pretty cutting edge. They're, they're new. Um, and by extension, automated mobile testing is bleeding edge. Um, so, so it's, uh, it, it's a bit early, I think, to expect that sort of level of maturity that we have in web development uh, in, in iOS development. Um, the next challenge that I had uh, was one of language choice. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I uh, decided to write uh, these uh, automated tests in Java because I was fairly comfortable in Java. Um, native driver supported Java. Um, and the iOS development team is obviously writing in Objective-C. And um, although um, many of them had, you know, certainly ex some experience with Java and, you know, were familiar enough with the syntax and um, uh, I tried to write the tests in a very readable uh, format, um, they just were too sort of busy and stressed out to um, go and investigate this code because it would pretty much require them to fire up another IDE. Xcode has support for Java, but it's pretty poor. Um, it was just this barrier that inhibited their curiosity. If it had been completely uh, frictionless for them to go and check out the test code and run it, um, they, they, they might have gotten a bit more excited about it. But you know, the thought of having to start up another IDE, that was a, that was a big deal for them. Um, so um, next recommendations. Um, some people say that wisdom is the ability to learn from your own mistakes and that true wisdom is the ability to learn from the mistakes of others. Um, and so I'm hoping to be able to impart uh, some true wisdom uh, today. Um, so my first recommendation, uh, if you're thinking about trying to uh, put together a suite of automated tests, um, show value early. Um, 
make sure that uh, you demonstrate this, the value of these automated tests that will protect the developers from introducing bugs into the system. Um, they, I think you know, developers don't want to ship buggy code. Uh, they, you know, and you know, I think you know, most good developers will do some like, very uh, simple smoke testing you know, when they think that they're finished with the feature. And if they can get that done in an automated way without really having to thinking about, think about it that much, they're going to want that. Um, and, uh, and again, it's about faster feedback. If, you know, it takes me a long time to have to click through uh, an application, even if it's a simple feature. Um, if I can do that automatically, I'm going to get that feedback that much more quickly. Um, next, um, surprise and delight. Um, this is a phrase that Apple tosses around with respect to its customers because they have this laser focus on usability. Um, it would be so awesome if they would apply the same thing to the developer community. But, um, as a test developer, your customers are the application developers. Um, and uh, you should try to su surprise and delight them. So you know, make it easy to run the tests. Uh, make it easy to see the presence of a failure. Make it easy to investigate further when a failure is detected. Um, as an example, here is uh, a little screenshot of uh, what it looks like when, when I run my suite of automated tests. Um, and uh, as you can see, the default target for, uh, for my uh, build file is just to run the test with sensible defaults. Uh, and the output um, is just an indication of what test is currently running and then what its uh, ultimate status is. Uh, then I get a nice little summary at the end. And um, what's not here is all of the extremely verbose logging that I could have put about, you know, potentially uh, what element we're looking up and, uh, you know, whether we were able to, able to find it, uh, what the uh, services on the back end were doing. All that get, stuff gets dumped to a log file, which I can then uh, name according to the uh, test scenario that's being executed at the time. Um, so um, I make it easy to see uh, at the high level what's going on and also to investigate uh, more deeply when things go wrong. Um, and above all, sort of just be responsive to your users. If somebody makes a suggestion about how they could, um, you could improve the, the tests, um, you know, see if you can uh, help them out. Um, next, uh, knowing your limits um, with regard to functional, uh, functional testing. Um, so I assume that most people here are familiar with the testing pyramid. Um, it would be extremely expensive uh, and probably unnecessary to try to get full coverage of your um, application with functional, at the functional layer. It's just the tests are too slow, they're very, difficult, they're very expensive to maintain, and it's, you really need to have a, uh, um, a conversation with the development team about uh, what sorts of things can be covered at the unit level, level rather than the functional level. Um, so uh, that's going to keep your, your build uh, you know, faster because you're not running more slower tests, uh, which is go again going to keep your feedback uh, coming quickly. All right. Um, so the future of native driver. Um, so when I started thinking about this talk, um, I kind of imagined it being a really in-depth um, investigation of sort of all of the different quirks of native driver. Uh, and to kind of you know, cap it all off with a big you know, call to action for participation in the uh, Native Driver project. Um, so you can imagine my surprise and delight when I saw this message pop up on the ma Native Driver mailing list several weeks ago. Um, I'm not sure if you can read all of that necessarily, but I've highlighted the important bit. Um, we've decided to stop work on the Native Driver project. We, that means we cannot add new features, maintain the code, or accept contributions. Um, now, remember when I said that you know, native application testing was bleeding edge? That's why I made the border red. Um, so this is a disappointment, um, but you know, native driver is open source. And already, some community members have um, you know, picked up the baton and are trying to move the project forward, which is great, which is fantastic. I think native driver has some features that are really fantastic. but um, I don't think it's necessarily the end-all, be-all of uh, you know, native testing tools. Um, 
There are some things about it that uh, certainly could use improvement. Um, and, you know, there's, I think, more importantly, there's, there's a big hunger for tools like this. Um, and a setback to one tool in particular isn't necessarily a setback uh, to the community as a whole. Um, there are lots of, lots of other uh, tools out there, as, as we saw earlier. Um, you know, I think, you know, we as a community need to figure out how to make them better and, and to contribute. So it's kind of an exciting time to be in this area. Um, so rather than kind of using this talk as a call for participation in Native Driver, I'm going to use it as a call for participation in the broader goal of creating a tool for testing native mobile applications that's uh, just as great as Selenium is for uh, testing uh, web applications. And so um, on that note, uh, I can only conclude with, um, you know, the future of mobile testing, um, it's in your hands. That's it. Thank you. Do we have a couple minutes for Q&A? Yes, I think so. Hi. Okay, <clears throat> so there's been a there's been a lot of buzz on native driver, which you addressed. That's gonna be one of my questions. Um, mobile automation in general. So, in in seeing your last slide, what is the current tool that has the most buzz moving forward? Um, is there something that we should be made aware of that should start to follow, or is it sort of an open ended? Hey, folks, let's all get together. And create the next big thing, but is there already something that's that's leading traction the th in that? Um, so the three that seem to have the most buzz at the moment um, are going to be uh, Kif, which is put up by the Square people. Uh, that's um, that's Objective C, uh, and um, it basically the tests run inside your application, uh, and so. Uh, that's, that's uh, one of them. Um, Frank is another one that sort of works in the same sort of model as Native Driver in that it embeds the HTTP server inside the app and then communicates it over uh, using a wire protocol. Um, and then there's a uh, new-ish one called Calabash, uh, which I referred to earlier. Uh, and I haven't really looked at that uh, very much, but uh, it does ha seem to have uh, a lot of buzz on you know, Twitter and everything. So those are, the, those are the ones that I would take a look at. Hey, I was just going to use this as an opportunity. I'm doing a lightning talk on a tool that will run native iOS automation. So if you want to see sort of my idea for how it should be done, there's a lightning talk on it. And it will cover a tool that I have that I'm looking, that will be open source sooner or later, that can automate your iOS or iPad or iPhone app without installing anything into your code. It just uses some native stuff in. Dan's given me a demo of this tool, and I think it's really cool. Yeah, I've shown um, it to Dante. We met up a couple but you, ago. But you need more buzz, so. Uh. Yeah, this is, this is a buzz generating lightning talk. So this is the hype to the hype to the hype. So yeah, come to my lightning talk. Anything else? Any other questions? Well, thank you. Thank you. So this next, next speaker, I'm very glad uh, that he's here. No, I really am glad you're here because uh, you sent a tweet an hour ago saying, <laughs> yeah. which tube station? I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> so thank you. I've gone up to three people with beards and say, are you Matt? <laughs> so thank you.